Okay, okay, everyone, we're alive on the stream, so keep your mic muted until you guys are actually ready to start, unless you're just giving some inner introductions or stuff.
Good morning, Krista. Thank you for joining us. Good morning and welcome everyone to the presentation. We are currently waiting for other folks to join in person and online. So we look forward um, to starting our presentation shortly.
really don't want to go against the self. Yeah. Keep people there. Do you want to get rid of the devil again? I saw a window was on. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in online. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the class of December 2020. Uh, they are called the anchor and they're going to uh, hold us secure and steady uh, and give us a great presentation on their senior project. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Anthony Battistini and I had the privilege of leading this talented team of engineers in training and I am happy with uh, what they came up with and I think uh, you'll be delighted to see what they did and impressed hopefully. And uh, without further ado, I will pass it off to the team and the project manager, Nicholas Gillette. Thank you, Dr. Battistini. Good morning. My name is Nicholas Gillette, and I was the acting project manager for the civil engineering capstone design presentation. And uh, during this project, we had uh, multiple phases that we went through and many design choices that we had to make. And we'd like to provide a, a brief overview of those decisions for you today. Um, I will begin today by going over a quick synopsis of the engineering design process and how it relates to the civil engineering uh, project. And then we're going to go over the class schedule. And then finally, we're going to wrap up with the scope of our project. So with the beginning of any engineering process, we're going to begin with the problem. Um, from the problem, give me one second. Thank you very much. We had some technical difficulty there, um, but we're going to begin with the problem in this process. Uh, so as we were able to, uh, whew, I'm going to take a step back in and, and readdress. So we begin with a process with a site investigation, as well as uh, gathering preliminary information. And this is a, a beginning of the, any engineering design process. From there, we were able as a class to determine the scope or the parameters of the project. We wanted to make sure that we specifically hit on every point that the client wanted uh, fix or that wanted addressed. And so in order to do that, we wanted to make sure that we determined a, a very strong scope. From there, we were able to offer the client different options. These options came in the form of a bridge or a culvert, as we will discuss a little bit later coming down the road. But upon the presentation, he actually wanted to see both of those options put into uh, practice. So we were able to give him two different solutions in the form of a design. So how did this look like? It looked upon the uh, lines of two weeks for scope preparation, another two weeks for our option analysis, and there we dove in eight weeks into uh, design. And so in this time, um, you can see over here on the right, we have a Gantt chart. This is our design only Gantt chart and kept each team accountable. And the teams are color coordinated for ease of uh, visual purposes. And this Gantt chart actually represents a timeline on a horizontal axis. So each of these bubbles or uh, blocks represents a task with a certain amount of time and expectation that the, the task will be completed. It also shows uh, dependencies and which one is necessary for other information or other tasks to get started. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with the project. The project itself is actually here in San Angelo, and you'll notice uh, it's actually north of Loop 306 and to the west of Highway 87. 
in this area, we're going to be looking at 11th Street specifically, and the area of interest runs from the entrance of Highway 87 all about 750 feet inwards towards Wendeland Manufacturing, who is our client. <clears throat> in this, we wanted to make sure that we understood the client, and when he came to us, he gave us a, a list of problems. One of those problems was it was hard for commercial traffic to turn on to highway or excuse me from the highway onto 11th street and you can actually see here that uh the highway alignment is in such a state that the lane that should be turned onto is actually just a single lane and while we were there on the site investigation we witnessed many 18 wheelers pulling into the oncoming traffic lane to make that turn and so this is a very unsafe design we also noticed that the pavement had degraded and had sprawling uh, cracks throughout it, as well as water pooling over the road in, in rain events. We were actually able to see these at the beginning of September, and we actually were able to witness and take pictures of the event. We believe this is because of their, uh, the undersized culverts that exist presently, as well as some of, <clears throat> as well as uh, years of un, uh, maintenance that hasn't been done on the road. So let's go ahead and finalize all of this into one scope. What we decided for our scope was to improve the 11th Street roadway from the intersection of US Highway 87 to the commercial vehicle entrance of Wendeland Manufacturing to accommodate two-way commercial motor vehicle traffic while adjusting stormwater damage and surface runoff issues. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this off to Nora. We are, we are going to dive in depth on the options. Hi, my name is Nora, and I will be talking about the option analysis. Just to give you an idea of our background information, as a group, we did research to be able to come up with solutions for our client's problem. We, as we braced through solutions, we ended up coming up with two options that will be later shown in the slides. For option one was our culvert design which we decided to go with the rectangular box shape that should be able to reduce flooding as it is shown in the image. For a proposed structure, it would have a width of 35 feet normal to US 87, a length of 40 feet normal to 11th Street, and a height of three feet normal to elevation, which we discussed by the Hydra team later on. Our option two was the, was the bridge design that would have a length of 25 feet long. It will be designed as an open channel to be able to reduce flooding. This option incorporated, incorporated all of the group's analysis, but for the geotechnical portion, it included the abundant design. In this image, you're able to see a preliminary design of the open channel, which will be discussed by the structural team. To be able to aid our client, we decided to come up with the decision matrix, which the score was based on a scale of zero to 10, as 10 being the highest. We divided it into three different criteria, which was cost, performance, and long-term impact. To be able to determine the cost, it was based on whichever had the lowest cost. As for the performance score, it was based on lower maintenance and higher aesthetics. And for the long-term impact score, it was based on the highest expected life cycle. And for, as we determined, the culvert design was the best option. Now I'm going to pass it to Jake for the hydro team. Thank you, Nora. Um, I'm Jake Gravel, and with me, I have Maria and TK, who made up the hydrology team for this project. To begin our site investigation, we, uh, we identified the hydraulic and hydrologic components at our site. Um, the most obvious, of course, is the poor road condition and the existing culvert, which is, seems to be undersized. And that can be kind of, picture a little picture but 
um, there's a large earthen channel bringing large amounts of runoff from a big area to the north that will have to be analyzed further in our design. Uh, and a large drainage structure that seems to be expecting large amounts of flow. So that gives perspective that our culvert is under size. And there's my picture. Um, before we start analyzing, we need to take a step back and take a look into the City of San Angelo Stormwater Manual. Uh, the Stormwater Manual is uh, the city basically has jurisdiction within the entire city limits of San Angelo, plus a three and a half mile ETJ, uh, which is seen on by the dotted line on the outside there. Um, and the stormwater manual outlines analysis requirements. The major one being you analyze the 100 year, 24 hour storm event. Uh, the next thing it outlines is analysis methods and the two analysis methods are an SES unit hydrograph method or the rational method. The difference is rational method use is for drainage areas less than 200 acres and then the unit hydrograph method is for larger. Uh, the design requirements they go quite a long ways and they're outlined of course through the whole design manual and those can be explored further if that's of interest to you. Uh, the defining characteristics of the rational method is Q equals CIA. Uh, our runoff, the runoff coefficient C for our project was actually a weighted runoff coefficient due to the fact that there's five different zones recognized by the city of San Angelo zoning map. Um, so we had to uh, have a weighted runoff coefficient. Our intensity value comes from table 4.1 in the design manual and that comes up to a value of 0 0.993 inches per hour. Our drainage area outlined by the yellow line drawn in the map is 160.32 acres. And those yield a peak design discharge value of 99.02 cubic feet per second. We decided to go with our bridge option design first because that was the easiest one to move along with in the rational method. Uh, so we knew that we'd have to convey runoff from below the bridge to the outlet structure in the tech start right away. Um, and we thought that the best way to do this was a reinforced concrete material with a rectangular section. Um, and the the channels modeled here with the slope of 0 0.0022 uh, from running north to south and a length of 100 feet spanning 20 feet underneath the bridge and setting the inlet at an elevation of 1829.97 feet. Going through the analysis, we know that it's going to have to drain for the design flow of 99.0 two cubic feet per second. Um, we do this by the, it's kind of an iterative process. You guess the velocity and then you figure out your slope with that velocity. Uh, and you just, you keep doing calculations until all your numbers work out and they all follow the design requirements in the stormwater manual. Um, by doing that, we found a flow depth through the, not the entire channel, but at the beginning of the channel of 0 0.99 feet. And this was found through the use of the standard set backwater method. Um, so now that we have our flow depth, we need to relate that flow depth with the velocity and the flow. We do that with the Froud number. And our Froud number came out to 0 0.88, which is below one. So we know we're at subcritical flow and there's most likely not going to be a hydraulic jump somewhere down the line. The next step in our analysis was to analyze the culvert option, and we did this through the HEC HMS program. Um, we began this by exploring ArcMap GIS to delineate a watershed, and that gave us some contours that we then measured individually to come up with surface data that we input into HEC HMS. Um, we had to plug in 
initial conditions in the HIC HMS. Uh, we are the, in an area that we have a type two storm event uh, at 7.09 inches of rainfall for the 100 year 24 hour storm. Um, the average curve number, there was five different soil types and the average hydraulic group came out to be the, the number corresponding to that group came out to be 79. And the drainage area is 0 0.25 square miles was the input in HEC HMS, but it's the same as 160. It's just 160 acres. It's just converted to square miles. Um, when we modeled our outlet in HEC HMS, we modeled it as you know a, a rectangular box culvert uh, running with the length of the road 40 feet, rising three feet, so a height of three feet, spanning 35 feet at the set and putting the inlet elevation at the same elevation as the channel previously discussed. But for this option, we're not going to slope the the culvert to you know make it uh, kind of uniform along the road. Here is the runoff curves for the culvert. The larger curve represents what is existing at the site. So we have 131.4 cubic feet per second flowing into the site. And the smaller curve represents what our culvert is going to drain. And that is going to drain 99.9 .9 cubic feet per second, which exceeds our design peak discharge of 199.02 cubic feet per second. And that flow, the design flow is represented by the I-100 storm line. For both options, here's our hydraulic profiles. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have with these. And I'll go ahead and hand it off to the structural team with Dane. Thank you, Jake. I'm Damon, and I'll be presenting the structural design group with our team leader, TK. Our team members included Nora, Branch, TK, and myself. So initially, we actually started with uh, matching the radius provided by the transportation group. This allowed for a proper entrance from US 87 to 11th Street so they could safely turn in without having to cut off the outer left layers or uh, roadways. And as you can see, we started out with a height off the 80 US 87 at 10 feet. This allowed us, this would allow us to properly build our abutment without any issues. We initially wanted a span of 35 feet just to be able to design our bridge efficiently built. Uh, this act, actually, sorry, let me go back. Sorry, I apologize. During this design, we actually ran into issues as we had a lot of overhang on our bridge. Overhang is just basically an unsupported, uh, unsupported part of a structure and our unsupported edges here uh, caused an issue in calculations as it would have required too much rebar uh, and we just didn't like the design overall. So we came with up with this new revised layout. We actually ended up adding adding members, adding beams, which reduced our overhang, but we also reduced the length of our bridge to 25 feet. We thought that this would allow for an efficient design. Uh, for our loads, we uh, Ashto actually specifies a 12 12 foot lane increments, and we uh, we are actually provided a vehicle by our client, as seen in the bottom. And we were also we did some digging to find out that our vehicles that are typically going through our roadway are actually uh, pictured in the uh, top right. And for calculations, we looked at the probability that two, or we looked at the probability of two Ashto trucks being on our bridge at the same time as it's wide enough to fit two vehicles. Uh, but for our client's vehicle, we could only fit one. So when we ran the calculations, we actually found out that our Ashto truck provided higher loads, and thus we built it for that, for the probability of two vehicles being on there at the same time. Uh, for our initial beam design, we actually chose a one foot slab just to get started. Uh, our tributary uh, length for this is actually eight foot as our beams are eight foot apart. So the load acting on our beam are actually the area contributed to it is actually eight foot wide. And uh, we designed our beam as a non-composite. That just means that our originally our concrete does not contribute to any strength. It's that all the weight is relying on the beams. This was to get the conservative calculation to get to the geotechnical team. That way 
they could start their design. And we ended up coming up with the W18 by 76 beam, which would hold our whole entire weight without any concrete structural support. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our team leader, TK. Hi, my name is TK. I'm gonna take y'all through the rest of our structural design. Um, so once we got some preliminary loads to the Geotech team, we then really dove into the ASHO code. And uh, the first thing that we started with was the load factors that they specify. Um, we determined that strength one there at the top left would be our controlling load factor. So we applied uh, a load factor of 1.75 to all of our live loads. And then for the dead loads, ASHO specifies two separate ones. Um, so you have a DC components and attachments, and then a DW wearing surfaces and utilities. So for the wearing surface, we dedicated two inches of our one foot slab to be the wearing surface, and then the remaining 10 inches to be the um, components and attachments. And then our beams, the dead weight from our beams also got the components and attachments uh, load factor. And so with the load factor, we then um, calculated the maximum moments that would be acting on our bridge. So uh, we modeled our slab in between our two beams that are spaced at eight feet apart. And we found that our maximum moment would come when the ASHO truck was, uh, the two tire loads were straddling the middle of the beam or the slab. And then for the negative moment, the max uh, value came when the truck was acting on the slab overhang on the ends. Um, and so with that, we then found our maximum shear, which occurred when the truck loads were just to the right of our support. So with these, we began our slab shear design. We designed our slab to be 10 inches because we needed to allow for the wearing surface of two inches to be removed. And so we then calculated what ASHO specifies as the width of a primary strip. And what this does is basically transforms our truck point loads uh, to act over an area. And with that, we checked to ensure that the ultimate shear is less than the nominal shear, which it was, meaning that we needed no transverse shear in the slab, which is typical for uh, slabs. We then went into the slab flexural design. Um, so we used the positive and negative moments that you saw in the diagrams earlier, and we checked to ensure that our ultimate moment was less than the nominal moment. And for the positive moment or the bottom seal, we found that number eight bars spaced at nine inches on center would be adequate. Uh, for the negative moment or top seal, we found the number four bars at 18 inches on center would be adequate. And then lastly, we found the number six bars at 18 inches on center would adequately resist any temperature or shrinkage effects that are acting on the slab. And so here is a cross section of our slab. Um, you can see the two beams and then we've got our specified rebar. And with that, we moved on to our beam design. Uh, we utilized the spreadsheet provided by Dr. Batts to aid in our calculations. We designed our beams as plate girder shapes, um, but as a composite, composite section with the concrete. So unlike before, this has the help of the concrete rather than um, designing the beam to carry all the weight by itself. Um, so we took the plate girder dimensions from the AISC manual and checked for the plastic moment and compared that to the ultimate moment. And then we checked the yield moment, lateral torsional buckling and local buckling. And so this allowed us to uh, find a more economical beam with a W16 by 67, as opposed to our previous beam that was an 18 by 76. And so with the final design set in place, we then went on to drawing our bridge and detailing. Um, so as you saw earlier, this is our plan view of the bridge. We've got a 25 foot span with seven beams and the outer two beams being skewed to help reduce the overhang of the concrete. Um, we then drew some cross-section details. As you saw earlier, we have the slab with the specified rebar, and then we have our beam with the uh, dimensions. And after that, we then moved on and dug into the TxDOT typical details to further detail the bridge. Um, as you can see in the top left, we have a bearing pad detail. We would need 14 total bearing pads, uh, one for each end of each beam. And then we also specified a skewed end detail which would be used for the two end beams that are, are skewed to reduce the overhang. Um, we have a diaphragm detail. These would likely go on the ends of the bridge in between the beams to resist any lateral forces that are acting on the bridge. And then lastly, we have a, a concrete parapet detail. The parapet would go on the outside of the bridge in order to ensure that trucks cannot drive over our bridge and fall into the, um, the alleyway. And lastly, here's an isometric view of the bridge. And with that, I will pass it on to Branch and the Geotech team. 
All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Branch Alley. I'm joined here today with the rest of the Geotech team, Nora, Patrick, and Jake actually participated a little bit with us as well. Um, we wanted to start today by discussing the process that we took in order to design our abutment for the bridge. Uh, we actually completed this under the option to design. We were strictly following that aspect of the design process. <clears throat> so to start out with, I wanted to give a little introduction to our site geology. Uh, so as you can see on the image on the right, we have our project location inside of our map created by Patrick. Uh, you can see that we're actually in the Holocene layer, which is co mainly consists of caliche and gravel, which you'll see in a couple of slides past this. Now on the top, the top image here, you'll see where we decided to put our boring holes. Uh, after collaborating with uh, Russell from Centurion, this is where we came up with our final design with our boring hole number three being on the far left side or boring hole number one being on the far left side, boring hole number two in the middle, and then boring hole number three on the far right side closest to US Highway 87. So with that being said, uh, we only wanted to go so deep with the first two boring holes. Uh, they only extend down to a depth of about five feet below the ground surface. Uh, the one on the far right hand side, boring hole three, was where the bridge is actually going to be located. So that's one actually goes down to a depth of about, of about 25 feet below the ground surface. Uh, our groundwater table can be seen here down uh, past the ML layer, which will be shown on the next slide a little bit more clearly so you can see what each one consists of and the depth of each one. So each of these here on the far left side is the, the stratum or what this, the layers actually consist of. Um, the ones that we're mainly going to be concerned with is where our, our foundation is going to be placed from the abutment or the final abutment design which is the ML layer on the far left side. It's gonna be extending about four feet into the surface. And it is mainly consistent, uh, consisting of very stiff, silty, sandy clay. Now, after we determine this, we wanna figure out what we wanna use for our backfill. So our backfill is, is essentially the soil that's gonna be retained behind our abutment design and on the opposite side of the bridge. So typically with these, we want to use a soil that has a coefficient of friction that is greater than 34 degrees. We want it to be cohesionless and we want it to be well draining. The reason we want it to be well draining is because any buildup of water on the backhand side of this is actually going to increase the loads created by the earth pressures. And we want to avoid that as much as possible whenever we're designing the abutment. So we also chose, we finally chose a well-graded sand for this soil, and then we wanted to use a fee value of about 35 degrees for this. Now, after this, we were actually given the loads from the structural design. As you can see up here, each one of them is listed from the point loads to dead loads, as well as the live loads from the trucks on the beam itself. Um, these are actually very conservative for the design. Uh, as you can see, they did change the, the beam to a W16 by 67. Uh, this actually doesn't change our design very much. It doesn't change the weights of the bridge. Uh, if anything, it only, like I say, it only makes the, the design for the abutment more conservative. Now, after we do this, we look, we dove into the FHWA 2008 manual. Uh, this was mainly due to uh, come up with the preliminary dimensions for our abutment design. We needed to know what uh, our footing width was going to be. We needed to know what the heel and toe were going to be and how wide the stem was going to be. So in order to do this, we know our initial height, which is or our clear height, which was nine feet. It had to be at least nine feet from the ground surface below the ground the channel. And it also had to go down into, we had to have it go down below the soil for the foundation to sit on a soil that was going to help it with its bearing capacity, essentially. So the table on the right hand side here doesn't really show the initial calculations that we came up with. These are some of the final dimensions that we found whenever we were doing our checks. Uh, whenever we're doing our bearing capacity checks and our moment checks, these actually these values actually raise quite a bit depending on how uh, how how we need to correct them in order to make those checks come out to where we're not going over in bearing capacity or we're not having any overturning issues. Now, for the loads, we used the ASHTO 2017 uh, manual in order to come up with values on the top in the top table here. These values were then applied to our loads that we're seeing in the bottom in order to give us our final factored loads that we use for the design. Um, these loads here, 
each one of these load factors up top were combined with the weight of the stem, the weight of the footing, and the weight of the soil, soil as well as the active earth pressure that's acting by the soil on the back hand side of the boat. Now, to begin with, we wanted to make sure that our sliding check was good. Uh, the sliding check essentially is that whenever we put this weight onto the soil, there's going to be a normal force acting up against the footing directly against it. And this creates a normal uh, frictional force that goes along the bottom of the footing itself. So this is going to be our forces that are resisting sliding movement of the above. So in order to do this, we needed to get a factor of safety of at least 1.5. And for our factor of safety, we came up with a value of about five, as you can see in the left-hand chart. Now, on the right-hand chart, we have our overturning check. Our overturning check was very similar in style to completing for the sliding check. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our moments that were causing overturn about the bottom point in this uh, were going to be a lot higher than our drive, moments that were driving the overturning. So for factor of safety, we wanted to use factor of safety of 1.5 again. Uh, for this calculation, we came up with our factor of safety of about 6.2 for our moment. And for that, we have it greater than 1.5, which was good for our design. And finally, we had the middle one third and bearing capacity check. As you can see on the image on the right hand side, we wanted to make sure that we had our, our ideal bearing stress acting on the bottom, which is in the trapezoidal form, which is shown by figure eight. And also, for the middle one third, we wanted to make sure that the resultant force, as you can see here, was acting in the middle one third section of the footing itself. So, in order to calculate this, we just had to calculate exactly where that the X bar or resultant force was acting, which was at 2.593 feet, and the middle one third was st started at 2.208, which makes that check good. So, in order to move on from there, we had to go to the bearing capacity check. A bearing capacity check actually was used. We used Vesich's equation in order to calculate our shape factors, our ground inclination factors, and all these other factors that are listed on the left-hand side in this chart. We plugged each one of those values into our Vesich, our Vesich equation, and it provided us with a nominal bearing stress, as you can see at the very bottom here, of a value of about 55,000. Uh, our Q max that's going to be acting on the bridge is only about 5,245. So with that being said, we came up with a factor of safety of about 10.6, which is well over designed for this project. Uh, but other than that, we were able to start with our structural design. And with our structural design, Patrick is going to take over and explain a little bit more in detail with that. Thank you very much. All right, so this is the general workflow for the structural design of the abutment that we followed, as you can see. For the workflow for the stem design, we designed the flexure steel first. Then we designed the shear stem thickness, and then we went with the uh, temperature and shrinkage reinforcement. Um, generally, uh, like an ACI, you would generally uh, design the stem based on the thickness first using the shear. But uh, Ashto and this example we were following from Colorado Department of Transportation, we did it the other way, so that that's the way we did it as well. Then uh, after you design the stem, we designed the footing, right? The footing consists of the toe on the heel design. We designed the bottom flexor transverse steel for the toe. Then you do the top flexor transverse steel for the heel. And both of those are, uh, you generally just get like a, a one thickness and use it for both of them. You're not gonna have two different thicknesses. Then we get the temperature and shrinkage reinforcement, right? So next, uh, these are the basic load diagrams acting on the abutment. You can see that that's the, uh, on the very, very far left, that's the earth pressure diagram. Then you got the shear diagram and the moment diagram. We didn't include surcharge, surcharge so uh, this is a very simple design. Then the bottom is basically the free body diagram of the uh, footing where you do a static, uh, you perform statics and take a section and determine the shear and moment at a, at a certain critical section. As you can see, there's two red lines. These are a critical section for moment capacity check. And the blue line is the critical section for a shear capacity check. And so that's how we get our uh, reinforcement. So standards and checks, right? Uh, we. We were using the Ashto LRFD bridge design 
manual, which is uh, basically we use chapters 11 and 5 to design the, the abutment. 11 is basically for the uh, external design of the abutment, and chapter 5 is more for the reinforcement design. <laughs> That's the uh, Colorado Department of Transportation uh, source or reference that we used. It's from 2020, so it's up to date. <laughs> um, this is just a, a quick uh, overview of the STEM design checks. There's no mathematics, and well, we, we did do mathematics, but I'm not going to show you that. <laughs> On the very far left, you see the moment capacity. That's where that's the uh, use an equation to get the moment capacity, right? Multiply that by a resistance factor, reduce the moment, and that has to be greater than than the applied moment, which is the ultimate moment, right? So right here you can see it's 137, it's greater than 127, so we're good. Reference right there is from AFSO 5.6.3.2, and the rest of it just follows the same. Right, put the spacing checks, shear checks. And uh, that's the uh, steel that we got for the uh, the stem, right? We got number eight at six inches center to center with a cutoff at every other, uh, um, we call it uh, bar at five feet, eight inches. Then we got the temperature and shrinkage with uh, number six. Uh, steel bars at six inches center to center as well. We got that from 5.10.6. It's just a, an equation that you determine it. This is the final design of the abutment, right? Use rubber, drew it in. Um, you can see where it has the number eight uh, steel at six inches center to center with a cut off at five feet, eight inches cut off is at that point where it's pointing at. They got the heel reinforcement um total reinforcement which is uh, i think we use number six at six inches center center oh no that's the temperature and temperature no yeah that's the same thing we use the same thing for the bottom i believe except for the uh the toe we use the same uh, steel that was used in the stem because it's a hooked bar right see the hook And this is basically the uh, design of the abutment. Now I'm going to pass it off to the transportation team, David. Hi, my name is Taylor Holscher, and I'm going to be telling you all about the transportation portion of this project alongside my team members, Damon, Erica, and Patrick. I'm going to begin by telling you about the existing conditions of the roadway. Here in the picture on the right, you can see that this is the current 11th Street Roadway. The yellow portion of the roadway is what our project covers. As you travel down 11th Street towards US Highway 87, you can see that the roadway narrows. So one of our design considerations was to widen the, widen the current 18-foot roadway to a 36-foot roadway to allow commercial vehicles to drive safely in each lane of the roadway. Another one of our design considerations was to widen the current turning radius off of US Highway 87 onto 11th Street to allow commercial vehicles to safely enter and exit the 11th Street roadway. We will also be grading the roadway to reduce the flooding that flows over the roadway during a rainstorm. Here's a quick clip of the existing roadway and then the new roadway on top of the existing roadway showing the widening of the road and the widening of the radius, which is widened to 56 feet. As you can see, two heavy commercial vehicles are able to safely make the turn on to and off of 11th Street Roadway. Here's the elevation view of 11th Street. Here on the right side of the picture is where uh, USI, US Highway 87 is located. And on the left side is where Windland Manufacturing is located. He, right here, you can see that there's a dip in the elevation of the roadway. This is where the uh, water during a rainstorm flows over the road. So our plan is to grade the roadway level so that that dip in the elevation will not be there. And so the, road, the excess water will go to the drainage, which will be over here by US Highway 87 in the bridge in the culvert. 
For our uh, pavement design, we needed to find the average daily traffic. So we met with Dr. Pronti and we set up a traffic count device at the site. We set up a pneumatic tube uh, traffic count device, which counts the pressures that are applied to the pneumatic tubes as a vehicle drives over them. Uh, we took a traffic count for a week and we found that our average daily traffic was 260 vehicles per day. During this process, we found that when a uh, vehicle drives the speed limit over the pneumatic tubes, it is counted as one vehicle. But when the vehicle drives slowly over the tubes, it may be counted as more vehicles depending on the number of axles on that vehicle. Because of this reason, our, we found that our average daily traffic was an overestimation, but our, it, it's, in this instance, it's better to overestimate than underestimate since we are designing for he heavy commercial vehicles. For our project, we will need to do construction in two phases. Phase one is the pink portion of the roadway in this picture, which includes the intersection of US Highway 87 and 11th Street in the roadway up until right past the first entrance into Windland Manufacturing. The second phase of construction is the blue portion of the roadway, which includes the remainder of the roadway and the second entrance into Windland Manufacturing. For both of the phases of construction, we needed to implement a detour plan. This is the detour plan for phase one. We included 14th Street as the main road on the detour route since it intersects directly with uh, 11th Street. And this will allow the businesses on 11th Street to stay in business during the time of phase one construction. And Winley Manufacturing will be able to use their second entrance away from US Highway 87 during phase one of construction. During phase two of construction, the same detour route is in place, which is the 14th Street Road, which intersects with 11th Street. This will allow those businesses on 11th Street to stay in business. And Winland Manufacturing will be able to use their the newly constructed Phase One roadway and the their first entrance into Winland Manufacturing during the Phase Two of construction. For our pavement marking, since our road is a low volume two way two lane roadway, we found it ideal to use the standard single broken yellow line in the middle of the roadway, which ind indicates that passing is permitted in both directions. I will now pass it on to Damon for the pavement design. Hello, everyone again. Uh, so for start our pavement design, we actually went to Dr. Apronti first to get guidance and to what we needed to do to get started. Uh, and along with that, we actually did some preliminary uh, research and we actually found a book written by Nicholas Garber and Lester Hall, as well as the Ashto book. These uh, gave us a good guidance on what we needed to do to design our pavement. And we also looked at the usage, what is what type of vehicles are going through this area, as well as our alternative ideas. So 11th Street, as you go west, it actually is just chip sealed right now, which is just basically a covering uh, over the uh, pre uh, the existing gravel. And we looked at that idea, but in our client's best interest, we decided that a payment design would actually be more efficient. Uh, so our, for our payment design, you have to the first thing you have to do is calculate the ESAL. ESAL is an equivalent single axle load. And it consists of all of these factors. Uh, the hardest thing for us was actually calculating the AADT, which is the average annual average daily traffic. And the only thing that we were provided was an ADT. So we had to actually use a monthly factor to convert this number over. And we ended up getting a value of 296.4 vehicles per day. And the another factor that was important to us was actually the growth rate so we actually had to predict this and we assumed a five percent increase in traffic over a 25 year uh payment design life and that gave us a value of 200 uh, roughly 208,000 vehicles uh so do it, using this value you need to plug it into we plugged it into this chart uh we need to assume a reliability we actually assumed 90 percent as we wanted this to be efficient for the customer and not fail and along with this, we need to assume a standard deviation. Uh, according to Nicholas and Paul, a uh, of 90% reliability comes with a standard deviation between 0.4 and 0.5%. So we split the difference into 0.45%. And uh, as you can see, if you follow the green line, uh, you can see our process. We started with the reliability. We chose our standard deviation, followed a line, 
Then we used our ESAL calculated. This is in millions, so it would be 0.2 million. And then we drew it. We used the modulus for each layer. This was a very iterative process. And it eventually gave us a structural number that was appropriate for our design. And to actually officially design our road, we needed to follow the design uh, a policy on the geometric design of roads and highways are formally known to the transportation engineers as the green book. And uh, we needed to follow the grading, the cross slope, the road sl uh, roadside slope and the alignment. And this is our final design for phase one. Phase one is nearest Highway 87. Uh, this does. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, as you can see, we got a asphalt layer of four inches, a sub subsurface as seven inches and a base of four inches. Uh, we decided to go with the hot mix PG 64-22, uh, as this is a, the most common uh, asphalt, according to local sources. Uh, and this is our cross section. As you can see, we included our uh, four and back slope. According to our design, we needed a four back slope of four to one. So for every four feet across, we need to go four feet down. And the same applies to our uh, four slope. Uh, and our slope for our road, we wanted a 2% that we could properly drain off the edges. And for our phase two, uh, we actually went with something different. So as we were on the site, we actually witnessed that the roads appeared to not be deteriorating due to traffic, but rather neglect. So we assume that uh, through calculations and correlations provided by Texas A&M, we actually use the geotechnical information to actually calculate our modulus for our, our soil. And it was actually strong enough and proved to be that we could only, uh, only thing we have to do on the uh, phase nearest windland is just strip the top layer and put our new uh, lay down our new four inches of asphalt. And the same uh, same cross section is shown here, but for the phase two, and then final for our final grading, we actually uh, uh, Patrick modeled this in Civil 3D, and we were able to get the cut and fill of what we need to grade this. We want to notch, knock our elevation down to 1841. It's just right below what it is now, and uh, we wanted to grade it to 1840 to phase to start of phase one, and then for phase two, of course, we need to fill. And according to Ashto, we uh, slope less than eight percent is ideal, and our slope here calculated is one uh, percent. And that is it. And now I'll hand it off over to the environmental group. Hello everyone, I am Maria Ochoa. I was the environmental team lead and Taylor Holscher was my team member. And let's talk about the environmental portion of this project. So let's just talk about the main things that are associated with the environmental aspect. So we're looking at the stormwater quality as you previously heard on um, people talk about and then the North Contra River, which is located here. As you can see, the project location site is here and it's in close proximity to that river. So we wanna make sure that we don't contribute any more contaminants to the river. And then just to give you a recap of the existing conditions, there are, there are some floodwaters that travel through. So we're going to look at how we're going to mitigate that. So just looking at the general details of this information, the construction is not disturbing more than one acre of land, which uh, categorically excludes it from the NEPA process. And so we're going to still use the stormwater pollute stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan, which is the SW3P. It's not technically required from the information that I'm about to present to you, but we're going to use that as the best management practices because the owner of this construction would still be held responsible if any new pollutants are introduced into that North Contra River water source. So just to give you an idea of how I came to that decision, this is a uh, piece that's coming out of this source. And so we followed this path right here because it's less than one acre of land disturbance. However, if it were to be more than one acre of land disturbance and part of a larger project, then we essentially follow this path along here, which would require permit coverage under the construction general permit, which would require the strict uh, implementation of the SW3 piece, which means that it would require follow up throughout the construction process and post the construction process. And then it would also require a site notice to be posted and a copy of that site notice to be provided to a member of the city. 
Now let's look at the best management practices, which I previously mentioned. So the main ones that we're going to utilize are listed here. The silt fencing and erosion control logs, those will serve to help prevent any sediment or debris to leave the construction site, whether it's via stormwater or other mechanisms. And then the storm, storm drain inlet protection will be utilized to prevent any, again, debris or sediment to travel uh, via any nearby inlet. And then we're going to use the concrete washouts. Those are will be used to ensure that any debris associated with concrete, whether it's mixed or brought on site, doesn't leave the construction site, so it's contained, which I'm going to show you here in a second. And then let's go ahead and look at that. So here is an example of some erosion control logs. Here's an example of silt fitting. Now, the most important thing to keep in mind with the silt fitting is that we recommend that it is placed on the south side of the 11th Street because that's the more direct path to the North Contra River. And then here is an example of the concrete washout. It's a simple mechanism, but it's effective in containing any debris associated with the concrete. And here is a site plan that shows the proposed locations of the concrete washouts, erosion control locks on the north side of the street, and then the silt filtering on the side of the street, as I previously mentioned. Now, these aren't, these aren't hard set things that have to be exactly as the site plan, as long as they are present. The contractor may adjust that if needed, but it is highly recommended to keep the silt fencing on the side of the, on the south side of the street. And then here is the storm drain inlet protection where it would probably be placed around here. It's about 69 feet from 11th Street going this direction. Now let's talk about the possible pollutants. So here you can see the possible pollutants that may be contributed to the construction site and may escape the construction site. So dirt piles, you know, as you heard, there may be grading and excavation and then waste garbage that may be contributed from nearby areas, which I will show you a map of the nearby businesses and homes. Equipment, which again, there may be, uh, there are some homes near the location site that may contribute. If it rains and there's like rusting equipment, it could potentially provide uh, pollutants, chemicals. This is more in the um, paint and plastic sizes that we use during the construction process of the road. And then dust, of course, during the grading or excavation of the road, and then noise. These are minimal, but I wanted to list them anyway because they are contributing pollutants. Now, here are the nearby businesses. As you can see, here's the road where the construction will take place. There are some homes here and additional businesses. Flow goes down this direction. So if it rains during the construction process, the pollutants that I previously mentioned could be introduced to the construction site. Now let's look at other contributing factors. This is from the Environmental Protection Agency. This is the wastewater indicator. As you can see, the North Contra River right now is in the 70th percentile in, in wastewater. So this is why it's important to implement those SW3Ps. Even though they're not required based on, under the construction general permit, we're still going to implement the ones that I previously mentioned to ensure that the condition of the water does not worsen. And again, hazardous waste, this is also the EPA. As you can see, there's a red line that goes through here, which means that this bottle of water is considered an impaired stream. Again, we don't want to worsen the condition as it is. And now I'm going to hand it over to Erica, who's with the construction team. Good morning. My name is Erica, and I will be discussing with you the construction portion of this. So for our first problem, um, we had some land constraints. Um, the reason is because we went from 18 feet in width of our road to 36 feet. So we had five surrounding landowners, that would be COSA, Textot, Women Manufacturing, and two private citizens. And our possible solution to this was to evenly distribute the road in between all parcels of land so that everybody <sighs> It gets taken away from properly or evenly. So our existing conditions of the road, we have the degradation of the, of the road that was discussed. We also have the restricted flow um, toward Highway 87, where that low area is, and also the utilities, uh, as I'll be discussing. So our utilities, as proposed by our client, he proposed to us that we should probably move them from the middle of the road to the side of the road. So we took this in consideration into our design. 
We also uh, we're going to upgrade the water line to a bigger diameter than what is there. And we are also going to leave the sewer pressurized so that we wouldn't have any issues later on. And uh, the, we're going to move the electric away from the road that is there currently because it's right up against the road. So in order to widen that, we would have to move some electrical line. So for our construction timeline, we have our demolition that's going to take two weeks, and this is to get rid of all the existing infrastructure. We're also going to make adjustments. This is to backfill low-lying areas and to also move those utilities out of the way. And for our construction portion, it's going to take anywhere from four to six months. So for our cost analysis, we based our cost analysis off of TxDOT's tech, low bidding unit prices. And we came up with a subtotal of just a little over 379,000. So for our culvert insulation, our option one, we actually came out to a grand total of just a little under half a mil. And for our option two, our bridge insulation, we end up coming up with a grand total of 653,181 and 62 cents. And I'm going to hand it off to Nicholas. All right, so uh, in order to close this uh, morning's presentation, we'd like to uh, go ahead and quickly wrap up, but we'd like to share a video with you about some of the things that we've learned this semester. So uh, as we begin to move on up here, we're going to play this video for you real quick on um, some of the things we've learned. So uh, this semester, uh, when designing the bridge, we had to follow the ASHRA specifications. Um, and that's something we hadn't done before, so that was definitely a learning experience. Uh, and it was similar to how we learned to design other things as far as like slabs and, uh, and beams and things of that nature, but it was a lot different. I learned to design and stuff. So one of the most important things I learned about this project is time management on our micro skill because usually like usually we're given problems and we have to like search but for ours we had to like define our own problem and kind of find our own route to become successful with our project the biggest lesson i learned was learning to ask for help because i'm not great at that so the way i went about asking for help is asking my teammate taylor to help with environmental or it was asking dr neil to help with hydro calculation um, and the other uh, way that I asked for help was asking one of my co-workers to, uh, to help me with uh, permitting and stuff like that for the environment to push them. So over the past four years, we've actually learned quite a bit uh, in each of our classes. So one thing that was pretty neat is we've always been asking ourselves, how are we going to be able to put all this together to solve actual problems? And senior capstone design kind of laid the foundation for us to put all this together and actually put what we've learned. Prior to senior design, I always drove on roadways and never thought of what actually went into the design of the roadways. But being a part of the transportation group has made me realize uh, specifics that go into this design, like pavement markings, detour plans, and pavement design itself. Okay, so what I learned in senior design was not everybody has the same schedule. Whenever you have a time, but you can all work together for a project that's a team project. As project manager, it was a unique experience to see how many people impacted the project, from um, faculty members to our client, as well as our uh, resident engineers that helped us around the city of San Diego. Each one of them left their fingerprints in a unique way that contribute and synergize to a uh, fantastic product. Thank you. 
Yes, uh, let me get to that slide right quick. Um, Can you repeat the question? Please? Yes, the question was um, for the HEC HMS method, there was two different runoff curves. Um, no, not even that. Before, uh, before you go to the HEC HMS, you already have calculated the with the oh, method. yes. The rational method, the calculation for the rational method is uh, outlined by the I-100 storm line. You go back to that. So, no, you're, you're right there. You can see the okay, yeah, that's what we calculated for the rational method. Um, what HEC HMS gave us, the area was actually bigger than 160 acres. So, it gave us an overestimate based on what we thought actually ran to the site and was conveyed to 11th Street. Yes, it uses a different method. Uh, and the other question was uh, regarding the box culvert. My question was in the final design, did you use one barrel or two barrels? Because there was a picture that shows two barrels. Right, that is actually, it's not representative of our design. Oh, the question was, do we have one barrel or two barrels in our culvert design? The one shown on the screen has two barrels. Um, our culvert will only have one barrel. So, so to follow up on that, I would like, that's just a basic question. You should one method for doing the calculation for a rectangular concrete channel on a separate one for a culvert it's a square box culvert so I, i'm not sure i understand why there's any difference between those two designs and there's not a lot of difference in my answer but the one, difference right? i mean they're both rectangular concrete channels so why was yeah. there any difference the question was is there a difference in the design for the open channel and the culvert. Uh, the difference is mainly the span. The concrete channel spans 20 feet under the bridge, and the culvert actually has an opening of 35 feet. The flow depth is the same through both. Can you clarify the size of the culvert again for Russell? The question was, can I clarify the size of the culvert? The culvert is, it spans 35 feet it has a height of three feet and it runs the length of the road at 40 feet. To follow up with hey Maria to answer this, uh, would you think, do you think that it will never be over the top by, by runoff? This, this, this is structure, this culvert. The question was, will there ever be overtopping based on the culvert design that we chose? Uh, based on the analysis we performed, we actually performed an analysis using an HYA program, which is a program, the de federally developed program. And we utilized that to put in some of the information that we got. So a lot of the information that we put into HECTMS, we also put into the HYA program. There are slight variations, but it was essentially the same information being put into the program. The only difference is that HYA will actually perform a slightly different analysis in the background where we'll look at uh, the, all the information that was put and it will provide this hydraulic profile that you see here. I don't know that this presented in the presentation, but it will provide a table that shows all the different parameters and different times that over flooding, over flooding could occur. And it essentially tells you whether it will occur. And the software is provided that there would be no overtopping based on the design that we provided. Does that answer your question? So does that, does that look at, few, at, at less probable events like 150 year or 500 year storm? Hey, you can specify, we specifically specified a 100 year storm. So, so a 100 year storm will look Correct. Okay. Any additional? Uh, okay. Why don't you mention 500 year that you went as, by, as high as 500 year uh, to check or something? Um, for the HY analysis specifically, we only did 100 here. I don't know that I don't from my recollection, we did not do 500 here. 
Could you clarify the proposed slope of the culvert? The question is, could I clarify the proposed slope of the culvert? Um, I don't know that off the top of my head, Jake. You zero. Zero. The slope is zero. Any follow up questions? Yeah, I have a question. Where did you learn all this drainage design and uh, standards? Uh, you, you, I mean, you use appropriate standards, and uh, the presentation was very clear about how you did the drainage design and made lots, at least for our chief tech, made lots of sense to me. Where did you learn all this stuff? The question was, where did we learn what, how we analyzed our project? Uh, we've learned this through work experience and through Dr. Pinon in his hydrology classes. Lots of work experience. And, and, and so you clarify um, particularly which standards to use and, and, and where to get that. Did that mostly come from your internal experience or from the course? It came actually through reading through the stormwater manual. So you actually have to read it to know what's going on. And I don't I don't know if anybody completely understands it. I'm sure somebody does, but there's a lot in it. Yeah, and the HYA that was utilized because I asked a uh, member of tech staff that uh, he recommended that we utilize it because he mentioned that it was easy. And then consequently, we also utilized it. And our hydraulic design doctor showed us how to put in and put the information correctly and how to view that information. Another follow up question on the culvert as to why it is flat. Are you not concerned with ponding? The question was, are we concerned with ponding since the culvert is not sloped? The culvert has a, an area big enough, the opening area, it's, it has a big enough area that no, we're not. It ponds a little bit back behind. The tailwater depth is actually 18, at the elevation 1831.3 feet, which it does not, it's just, I mean, less than six inches higher than what's in the culvert. And that's seen on the profile. Can you go to the last slide? Right there. The tailwater depth is represented by the dotted line on the very far left. Looks kind of that. Well, I'm trying to accomplish by reducing the slope to zero. So if you have a positive slope in the catchment, then you reduce it to zero. What parameters are you trying to reduce or to change? The question was, what parameters are we trying to change when we change the slope to zero? Uh, what we're changing here is we are shooting for subcritical flow. Uh, the red line, the red dotted line on the culvert hydraulic profile represents the critical depth. Um, if it is sloped too much, it's going to be closer to the critical depth and we're going to have more probability of having a hydraulic jump somewhere down the line. The slope actually reduces, or it it gets us closer to the normal depth, which is actually a deeper depth than the critical depth. You can't see the dotted line. It's actually the the water profile is on that line. We're done with the culvert. Who's done that? I'm satisfied. <laughs> There's a there's a foul language on uh, in an environmental slides that I'd like to object to, but I'll talk about that later. That's slide 83. The four letter word at the top of the slide. Um, <laughs> I'm really upset about it. Explain theoretically that has already been disturbed and messed up, so <laughs> that is my defense to that. Uh, I'm sorry, I really didn't have environmental questions. I just wanted to. Uh, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I do have some questions for the, the uh, retaining wall design. Uh, 
Uh, so I, I'll commend you for having a very clear presentation of what you did, but I have some, I have some loaded questions. You calculated, so when you were doing your overturning and your very best, you, did you include the vertical loads of the, of the bridge on the abutment? Yes. So we, we okay, you, got, you got really high factors of safety and stuff. Yeah. So do you, can, do you ever foresee a time when the uh, abutment is placed, filled, and there's actually not a bridge on it? Uh, so the question was, and, 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 if, and if you do, does that change your, the, your analysis and the factors of safety that you So the question was, if we ever foresee a time whenever the abutment doesn't actually have a load induced by the bridge on it. Um, and the answer to that question is, for our design analysis, no. Whenever we started this, we only included like a 12 foot section of this, and we only included it to have like the initial loads that were going to be included by the weight of the bridge on it itself. So, so then I'd like to ask your construction team how they thought the design process, the construction process for the bridge is going to occur, and whether that's a good assumption that the structural design team. Yes, I will. The question was <laughs> whether or not the construction team had foreseen whether or not the bridge would always be present on the abutment. And that was not uh, a part of the analysis that we had determined. Now, I'll, 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 I'll comment that I suspect with the, the factors of safety that you were presenting, you probably don't have a problem. But you should definitely check that because even after the, um, I mean, sometime if you do the bridge, sometimes they're going to replace the deck, right? The deck's going to get stripped off, and they may have to replace the whole bridge. So that those abutments are definitely going to be there without those loads. Um, uh, and you also said you didn't include these surcharge loads, uh, and I, I wanted to, uh, for the design of that. I'm wondering about the rationale for not including surcharge loads. Um, I want to say this is in the context that I've done a very good job of doing design, setting a rationale, and, and that's I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the, the overall design. But I think loads are pretty important. Yes, I agree. Uh, we did not include a surcharge load. And what do you think is the most likely surcharge that would be there? Um, that, you, that you didn't include? Well, the ash tow uh, truck driving over at a certain point. After the abutment, which didn't include it, uh, I don't really have a rationale for that. Hey, again, I think you, you should check these things. Yes, yes, I agree. And then, like, more or less with, with the loads that we had already calculated on it, we felt like it was going to be an over design as is. So, whenever we start putting more and more loads on that, it's, and, and two, whenever we have that surcharge load, as it goes, as that load dissipates down through the rest of the foundation. It's, it's going to spread out to, to a point where it's very minute in comparison to the actual point loads of the bridge. Yeah, you, but you need to do the calculation. Right. Because, right. I mean, that's when these things fail is when, you know, some guy decided to put a crane at the edge of the thing because they were going to do, they were going to, they were going to pick the bridge beams off for some, you know, for some reconstruction thing and they put a crane there. And now, not only do you not have the vertical load, but now you got it higher. You know, so, I mean, you, you need to do those, those checks. I have a similar question about for the structural team. And the astral load uh, combinations, did you include, did you include uh, impact loads, traffic impact loads? Can you talk about putting a parapet up specifically to keep trucks on the highway, should they, on the road, should they happen to veer off the road? And then did you include those loads in your structural design for the bridge? So the question was, did we include a, an impact load? Going through our load factors, uh, we did not. We only included um, our strength load factor and then um, the two dead weight load factors. So that wasn't something that we uh, got to. But that's the same, same, same general comment. Right. right. So, and I, I, I would like to say I was extremely pleased with the way you presented the. the the iterative nature of the design. You started off without a composite design. I went, why aren't they using a composite design? And, and then you presented how you did that and the rationale for and, and the changes in the locations to be once you did your initial analysis, that iterative process that you showed in the decision making process. 
that you showed for your decisions. I was that was uh, commendable. So thank you for that. So I'm picking on details because I can't find anything else to pick on. <laughs> for the geotechnical team, you had some relatively high factors of safety. Uh, Russell would like to know why. And uh, if you were concerned with over engineering and construction costs associated with uh, so the question was if we were generally concerned with the high factors of safety that we calculated when we were doing our design checks. Uh, that is one of the number one things that we looked at whenever we had this. Now, one of the main goals that we had was to make sure that we had each one of these loads as correctly as possible after being provided loads by the structural team from TK. Uh, the main issue with that was there was a lot of iterations that went into the spreadsheet design whenever we were actually doing our calculations uh, for the, the, the load factors. Now, they all, they, it is always going to be a, a main issue. Um, if we were going to continue with our process, we would definitely look at uh, bringing down some of the dimensions in order to fix the problem uh, of having higher factors of safety. Uh, mainly, the main things that were causing this were the size of the stem. The main reason that the size of the stem was two feet was mainly so that we could uh, account for having that bridge sitting on, sitting on the saddle whenever the design was completely uh, said and done. So, I mean, with the weights of the, the abutment itself, it kind of made some of those factors of safety jump up. But as far as over designing, uh, that is an issue. Uh, if we were continuing with the design, we'd actually have to try and knock those numbers down as, as much as we could. Oh, uh, for the, the, the transportation team, you, you talked about where the boring locations were. Was those, were, those, were those designed by you, or is that just what you had from the uh, so the question is from the existing project? Uh, so the question was, where did we obtain our geotechnical report? Uh, we actually obtained this from uh, uh, Centurion. Uh, they provided us with the details, and we just based our calculations off of what they provided to us. <laughs> So you didn't select those boring locations, those are the ones that were there? Yes, sir. We were provided three borings, so we used that data to for our calculations. And I was confused about what, what C dot um, spec, uh, specification you're using and why you chose it. I'm not objecting to it, I just didn't understand which ones you were using and why you were using it. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, from taking classes here at Angela State, we didn't really go over ASH till we went over ACI, American uh, it's a uh, concrete institute, right? So uh, we we're trying to look at examples on how to design based on ASHTO. So uh, the Colorado Department of Transportation really had an up-to-date 2020 um, design cast in place uh, abutment design example. So uh, we use that to basically uh, base our design on. Oh. Thank you. Like I don't want to ask a question. Uh, what did, what, uh, like the cost estimate is always a, a, a difficult task for these, so, or a cost estimator. What's not in your, what was it, half a million to, uh, half a million to 600,000? What's not in there that, and particularly the stuff you talked about? The question was, what is not in the cost estimate? And, um, as far as the cost estimate, we got as close as we could with the generalized line items that they had. Um, as far as, are you looking for a specific line item? Well, what, I mean, tell me what was included because you talked about you talked about a bunch of much of utility work, much of the utility relocation is that included in there? So the utility work was added as a line item. If you uh, pay, look at page two of the appendix of the report for the construction team. Yeah, somehow I haven't gotten it. I totally understand, but on the very bottom, we do uh, summarize uh, total improvements to San Angelo, and that includes the work done by the city of San Angelo to readjust the water line for uh, the AEP has already volunteered to move the electric pole in the area to readjust it to a finalized location. And all of these things were uh, summarized and they came up to, I want to say about $76,000 that isn't going to be billed to the client directly, but are still in direct improvements to the street. Pretty good. And that's 
And it was all really only seventy six thousand dollars to do all that utility relay. Uh, according to our our cost estimate, using the uh, unit pricing. Okay. Did you include your um, that is a good point. We did not because we don't have a finalized number and the 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 person's property that we are going to be uh, moving into and needing that easement from, it's quite a chunk of the uh, parcel. And so we we really didn't know how to quantify what that person would be asking for as far as comp compensation. Um, and uh, Centurion right now is still, to our understanding, still in the process of trying to get those finalized. So we wouldn't, we couldn't even steal the numbers. So not that we would, but we couldn't use the numbers that they they have uh, they haven't finalized yet. Well, I think uh, from our perspective, you did a great job. One of the things uh, in developing your construction timeline and in, in developing those, those process minutes, make sure that you are including in was did we consider any other types of payment other than our asphalt and we did we like do you mean as in rigid payment or flexible so when we first did our now started our analysis we actually obtained a small e-cell which classified our road in way is actually a low volume which did not warrant for a rigid payment so if we implemented a rigid payment it would just be way more expensive than what it should be essentially what payment are you recommending using between the either the culvert or the bridge and 87. Yeah, we're going to use the same. It's, this, can, this design is actually the same throughout. The phases, so from the beginning of phase one, the US 87 to the beginning of phase two, uh, that's going to be all the same. Uh, actually, that's, yeah, it looks like a down. I'm not sure I know the phasing. I just, I just mean between 87 and the start of the Yes, I, yes. Uh, so we actually talked about that. We're, we didn't really, we didn't consider that we should have, but we didn't consider that that distance between that two extra twenty foot. But we idealized using the same same design as phase one. We were going to originally we were going to put in a concrete uh, roadway uh, entrance, but uh, through observations we found that we we realized that there's no like rutting issues. So it's not the fact that the materials are strong enough; it's just the fact that. Uh, it's been neglected. It has been maintenance in the, in a while. Do you think it can get running at, at the intersection? As of right now, there's no running. So we right now it, it appears as though it's just like a chip seal kind of. There not there's not any real actual design from the from what it appeared. And I have a question about your easels. Uh, so you did measurements, and then and then you did your volume road calculation and you talked about your concern about escalations for the future. So I'm just curious about how those, how did that all fit together? I mean, what, how did your measurements compare to what you were, your initial easel calculations came out to be and then what did you finally decide to escalate for your design line or whatever it was? So the question is, how did we acquire ESAL? <laughs> uh, yeah, how, how did you compare with the measurements? 
Uh, so there is actually, we've actually looked around through GIS. We tried finding like data just in general of the area. And there's for our particular road, there was no actual data collected, I guess, because it's a, such a low volume road. So we had nothing to really compare it on because they didn't really have it much for our type of road in the area. So yeah, uh, with our growth rate, we assumed uh, we asked Dr. Apronti if a 5% increase was okay. And he said, generally, that, that sounded like a good number for our particular project. And a 25 year lifespan, we just assumed it as, you know, it's, it just seemed like a good number. Actually, it didn't seem like a good number. We wanted to engineer our payment for 25 years. Sorry. And how, does, and how do those numbers compare to what you, I'm just curious about how they compare to what you measured. I'm assuming that's way higher than what you measured. Yeah. The, no, what the, the, the design easiest. Yeah, yes. I mean, you, you measured traffic. You measured the the the, the average daily traffic, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So how did your design easels compare to that? I don't know. I couldn't I remember from one slide to the next. Yeah, I guess it was actually a decrease from our calculations because it went from two hundred and six or two hundred and sixty to two hundred and actually no, that's not right. Two hundred sixty thousand or two hundred eight thousand vehicles. I'm confused by the question. <laughs> what Sorry. did you measure for your average daily traffic? 260. And, 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 what, and what was your design? Uh, 208,000 vehicles. Because this is a span over a year. Daily, right? No, no, that's an annual. Like That's just like a overall to the whole period of a year. Yeah. 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 Sorry. I, 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 I'm just curious about what you, how how what you measured compared compared to what you actually designed. Was it like did you design five times what you measured, or, or well, it's a combination of all of those factors, pretty much, because it's 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 just really complicated. I don't, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry, I don't know, I don't know how to I properly. Is the number that they measured. I don't. I, it's, I don't know how it compares. We didn't do like the math behind it. Okay. The yeah. amount that it increased or lowered from. Yeah, that, that's what was used in the calculations for the eastbound number. But the, I'm, as I'm understanding, the question was how does this eastbound number compare to the amount of vehicles per day that we calculated with average daily traffic? And we didn't do the calculations as to if our value for the average daily traffic was lower or higher than that. Uh, one more question for the structures team. Uh, the question was that the bridge girders were mentioned as a W16 by 67. Uh, this is a relatively uncommon size. Were deeper, more commonly available members or built up members considered during the design? Uh, so the question was I don't even know how to repeat that. <laughs> were, there, were there different? Uh... The question was uh, W16 by 67 members are uncommon in design. Did you have other considerations? Um, so initially, we used the AIAC manual to find uh, a beam that we could use, and that was really just to give something to the geotech team. Um, and then after that, we designed it as a plate girder. So we essentially use the AIAC manual to find the dimensions of a more economical beam, and took the plate girder dimensions from that and used those dimensions in our calculations. So um, I'm not sure that that's something we get to in our schooling, but uh, that's probably more of like an advance. But we essentially just designed as a plate girder shape. OK, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, I'm going to uh, officially cut us off here. We have reached 930, and uh, this is the final exam day. So some of these students are going to be in an exam in another hour. So uh, we need to give them a time to take a breather. But let's give them a round of applause again. We had lots of congratulatory comments come in on our YouTube stream and on the WebEx. So everybody, uh, in general consensus, great job. Uh, good work, go engineers. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us uh, in person, online, and I look forward to seeing you again next semester. And I wish everyone up here the best of luck in your careers. Well done.